good morning, everybody. I invite you to come on in and find your seat. We will get our service underway. It's good to see you so many here. Good to see all these uh, teenagers just got promoted up from Miss Amber's class. Clayton, good to see on the front row, man. You want to preach this morning? I'll trade you straight up, dude. I'll give you my notes. You want to talk about the Old Testament temple and the, and the tabernacles? That sound like a good idea? Nope. All right. All right. He just looked at me like, shut up, dude. No way. So anyways, but uh, we're glad you are here. Uh, today actually begins Vacation Bible School. Uh, after service this morning is our setup. Okay. You don't have to, or if you haven't signed up to help in Bible school, you could still help by staying afterward and helping decorate today. Ladies, we could use your hands downstairs. Some guys, we could use your help in here decorating, setting up uh, the flats and building the stage, doing some things like that. If you don't intend to help in Bible school and you didn't even know about after service today, but you'd like to, uh, let somebody know afterwards so we can make sure we have enough food for everybody. We feed all the workers and everybody after service uh, just so we can get rolling right after church. So thank you. If you can't do any of that, you can do a couple things. You can give financially to help offset the cost of Bible school. It costs a lot of money to put Bible school on. We hope to have tons of kids here. Last year, I think we had four or five kids saved in Bible school. We want the Lord to bless our efforts for that. Also, uh, you can pray, right? We all should be praying for Bible school. You know, when I came to the church, uh, at the time, the church did not do anything during the summer. They, they used to do Bible school, Joey, but they, they weren't doing it anymore. And I was kind of talking to the, to the deacons and trustees and the staff. Well, my staff was mad at the time. That's all I had. Um, and I said, what do you guys do during the summer? And I said, ah, we just kind of take the summer off. I said, well, there's a new sheriff in town, and we're not going to do that anymore. I said, you know what? We got to have something to keep people interested in church people thinking about the church because we want them to start coming back in Awana. And so we put by a vacation Bible school back in and we're coming up. Let's see, this will be our, like our ninth one I think we've had and, and God has blessed it. We've probably had well over a hundred kids saved in the last nine years of doing Bible school. So I know it's one of those like old school things, but there's an old phrase out there that says, if it ain't broke, don't fix it right? So if I could play spoons for you and someone would get saved this morning, I would play spoons, right? I would get some spoons, but I can't do that. Uh, if we can get someone to understand Jesus Christ and be saved, man, we want that. And so Bible school starts tomorrow night. Because we're setting up all day, there's no service tonight, so make sure you understand that. But you can pray, you can give, and you can serve, all right, in any one of those capacities. But I'm excited for Bible school. Always a fun time. Into the wild. It's a jungle theme. It's a jungle theme. So thank you for all that you do. If you're a guest of ours here today, we are glad you are here. In the seat in front of you is what we call a connect card. We would encourage you to fill that out. Go by the Welcome Center, that desk right outside these doors to the left. Drop it off. We'd like to have a record of your visit so we can help you in any way possible. But also that uh, they have a gift for you as well. So we are so thankful that you are here. Let me share a couple blessings with you. Now, two things, actually. Number one, uh, many of you know Pam Mullins. She took a fall this week, and of course, Pam takes care of Bob and you know, Bob, Bob's no 100 pounds anymore, Granny. He, he weighs a little more than 100 pounds. Yeah. <laughs> she said, tell me about it if you didn't know. Okay? So she, she took a fall. And they were afraid she broke her wrist. And so she was going to the doctor, get it checked out, probably looking at surgery, maybe a cast. Now, now check out what happened in the waiting room. Now, I know, like, we all get wigged out by weird things. P things, are, uh, things can be a little weird, Right? But this was not one of those weird things that was just odd. So there was a lady, it was a woman, right, Pam, is who it was? Okay, she was just in the, well, in the waiting room, and she goes up to Pam, and so Jeffrey, you're going to be Pam for me this morning. And she says, hey, can, can I pray for you? Is there anything that I can do for you? And she says, well, I got this wrist. Now, they had x-rayed it, right, Pam? They had, now listen, they had x-rayed this thing and found breaks, fractures, okay? And Pam, or Jeff, 
tells this lady what had happened. And so this woman prays for Pam right there in the waiting room, okay? Now we know in waiting rooms, you're only waiting like five minutes, right? So I'm sure it was a short, I'm sure it was a short prayer, right? You know, you just, oh, you're here at 1015? Come on back, we're ready for you. No. Um, so Pam goes back there and the doctor examines it. They check it out and the doctor says, your wrist isn't broke. And, and Pam's like, uh, dude, they, they took x-rays. She, he's like, well, I'm going to check it again, but I'm telling you, your wrist isn't broke. I can tell you this. Uh, we just prayed over Jessica last week. This woman prayed for Pam. Her wrist isn't broke. I believe that's the power of prayer talking, guys. Let me give you an update on Jessica. Uh, they've been checking her and doing things, and they finally believe they found the culprit. Jessica goes in on Tuesday uh, to have a little bit of intestines and perhaps some part of her colon removed, but they believe that she'll be okay after that's done uh, and, and be totally able to go back to normal life. So you know what? We prayed on Sunday that she would be healed or get some answers, and we got that. Okay, so that's a blessing. Now, I saw David come in. Dave, would you stand up and wave? You're going to kill me, man. You're going to be so... Dave, would you stand and wave? Okay, that right there is my friend Dave, okay? Dave works at Schreiber's, right? Works at Schreiber's. Russ invited Dave to church. How many years ago, Russ? Long time, right? Dave can only come on Sunday nights. And I know many of you don't even know we have Sunday night service, but we do. It starts at 6 o'clock, and it's only 30 minutes, 35 minutes. Unless I'm on a roll, we might get a little longer. But it's just us and the Word of God. But I don't care if, how many of you stop coming or don't. As long as Dave can make Sunday night service, we will have Sunday night service. Because that's the only service Dave can make. Well, I hadn't seen Dave in a couple weeks. So I'm talking to Russ, what's going on? He's like, man, I, I haven't heard from him. So I, I sent a text to a number that I had in my phone for you. It wasn't your number. Okay, That's how Dave is, man. He's super chill. He sits on that back right side and holds down that corner of the building. Like, literally, that's his spot. So I send Dave a text on the right number. He says, oh, pastor, I've been in the hospital 10 days with some, uh, you know, abdomen problems. I'm like, what? He's like, yeah, but I'm okay. I just got out. I'm good. I was kind of mad, Dave. I'll tell you, I was kind of mad at you. But here's the deal. Not really. I'm just messing with you. But here's the cool thing, guys. Dave's in church today feeling much better. So I put that out there for prayer. People were praying for Dave. And you know what? We're glad you're here, brother. I'm sorry I embarrassed you coming in, but that's what happens when you show up a few minutes late to church. You know what I'm saying? So Dave's feeling better, and uh, I'm just glad he's here today, all right? So you know what? I want to get our services started. we got a lot of things to do today, and I hope you're here and ready to worship the Lord. Let's stand to our feet. Get around. Greet somebody. God bless you for being here.
join me, if you will, in Hebrews chapter 9. We're just going to keep rolling through the book as we have uh, throughout, I guess, the last several months. And I hope today that you are ready to be out with the old and in with the new. You'll notice that's the sermon title on the back of the bulletin, out with the old and, well, we're not in with the new yet, that's next week, but out with the old. You know, there are some things in life that just need to be retired, okay, Uh, or put out to pasture, is what they would say. Um, I was trying to think of a few this morning of what I would call things that need to be retired, okay? Some of you might be holding on to CDs, right? CDs are probably something that could be retired. Some of you might be holding on to your 8-tracks. You really need to retire those. Um, Betamax, boy, that was the hot thing back in the 80s. You know, Betamax was going to replace VHS. And then Laserdisc, right? Laserdiscs. So there are things that that come along that uh, are temporary. They, They don't have staying power. Now, one thing we do know about is the Word of God is more than staying power. The Word of God has been preserved forever. We have it. It will never go away. So when we read the Word of God, we know that we are reading something that is eternal and is essential. All right? Uh, your collection, ladies, some of you might have collected glassware. Back in, or precious moments, right? Precious moments. Or Furbies, Right? And then you move up to Beanie Babies. How many of you used to collect Beanie Babies? Uh, you got took. Yeah, they're not worth anything. Right now, it's Funko Pops. That's the, that's the trend. Everybody, all, all the younger kids and the teenagers and college aides collect Funko Pops. My interns have an office, and they have a shrine of Funko Pops in their office. Don't know how much they've spent on them, but it's not cheap. I actually own a few myself. But... I'm not betting that one day I'm going to be able to retire off of Funko Pops. They're they're a temporary thing. They're a man-made thing that the market determines its value. And once that market crashes, they're not going to really hold much value. But I can tell you today that there is something in life that holds a great value. There is something in life that we always can cling to as essential And that is something that the Lord Jesus has done for us by sacrificing his life for us. That is an eternal thing, something that will last forever. But to get the place or to the place where we understand that, we need to go to Hebrews 9 and take a look at something that was old that had to be retired so that the new could come into place. Last week we talked about a covenant, right? There was covenants in the Old Testament that were important, that were essential, but ultimately were retired as Jesus came and instilled a new covenant or a much better covenant with his own blood. Join me in Hebrews 9, if you will. We'll look at three things this morning that had to be retired in order for something better to come along. Verse 1. Then indeed, even the first covenant had ordinances or rules or, uh, you know, just guidelines of divine service and the earthly sanctuary. For a tabernacle was prepared. A tabernacle was a tent. The first part, in which was the lampstand, the table, and the showbread, which is called the sanctuary. And behind the second veil, veil is a curtain, by the way, the part of the tabernacle which is called the holiest of all, or the holiest of ho- or the holy of holies, if you will. Verse 4. Which had the golden censer and the ark of the covenant overlaid with all sides of gold, in which were the golden pot that had the manna, Aaron's rod that budded, and the tables of the covenant, or the Ten Commandments. And above it were the cherubim of glory overshadowing the mercy seat. Of these things we cannot now speak in detail. Okay, the first thing I want you to understand about all this old stuff, this old tabernacle, this old temple that of course is no longer there, 
all the furniture that was inside is it was made by human hands. Think about this for a second. It was made by human hands. My friends, I can tell you today that God is not a God that has been created by human hands. He is eternal. Our Lord Jesus Christ has been around forever. He is eternal, just as God the Father and God the Spirit. Now, the reason why this is important is everything that was listed there was, was made by men and women. It was created according to guidelines given by God. Now, I did a little research on all the artifacts in the temple. Let me give you some examples. Okay, In the outer courtyard, outside, was a giant altar. And I mean, it was big. It was massive. And basically, it was built with bricks around it. There was large flame. There was a grate on top. And that is where the priests sacrificed the offerings on behalf of the people. The responsibilities of the Levitical priests, people would come and they would bring their offerings on a sacrificial, on a, uh, uh, what am I trying to say here, uh, altar that was made with human hands. This is so important. I'm going to be driving this point home today because I'm going to bring you to the understanding, if you don't know it already, that the salvation you have in Jesus was not with your own hands. It was the shed blood of Jesus Christ as they pierced his hands and they pierced his side and he gave his life. So we're trying to build the case of a superior Lord, a superior Jesus. Next to it was a giant, you could call it a, a pot, if you will. It was full of water and that's where they would cleanse themselves. They would wash because sacrificing animals all day long is not exactly a uh, clean job, if you will. All right, this is something that is very dirty. But again, these were all done by priests. Inside the tabernacle, there was a table. And there were 12 pieces of bread called showbread. And on that represented the 12 tribes of Israel. Okay, you get a little further into the tabernacle, and there was a menorah. If you don't know what a menorah is, it's a candlestick. You might understand Hanukkah. Jewish people, right? That, that lamp, that candlestick, that's what we're talking about. Had seven oil lamps on it, okay? They would light that. It would bring, uh, you know, light to the room. It also represented, uh, you know, the, the presence of God, if you will. God is always pictured as light, okay? Uh, you had the incense altar. There was an altar that constantly uh, made a smell in the room, in the tabernacle. Uh, it's the idea of uh, you know prayers being lifted up to God. Okay, each one of these items had a symbol to it, but again, they were all crafted by human hands. Then you get into the veil, the giant curtain that was between the inner sanctum and the outer sanctum, and inside that curtain was the Ark of the Covenant that contained Aaron's rod, that contained the Ten Commandments, a few other items. The priest, the high priest, only entered that Holy of Holies one time a year to offer an offering on top of the ark for the sins of the nation itself. Now, a lot of people don't know much about the furniture simply because we're not Jewish, right? We, that, that covenant doesn't belong to us. There are people out there who have made it their life's goal to find the Ark of the Covenant. How many have ever done any research on whatever happened to the ark? Okay, there's a lot of theories out there. One is it was uh, smuggled into Ireland. The Irish have claimed it. Some believe it was smuggled into Egypt, and that's kind of the story that uh, Steven Spielberg used in Raiders of the Lost Ark. They're in Egypt looking for it. Some believe it's buried uh, whenever Nebuchadnezzar came in to destroy the temple and, and haul off all the slaves, he, that they buried it deep in the mountain that that temple was on. Don't know that because, simply put, there's a Muslim temple on top of that, that rock right now. But here's the catch. That ark had symbolism, and if anyone touched it, they died in the Old Testament. But the ark was not their salvation. The ark symbolized the presence of God. That ark is gone. We don't know what happened to it. John references the idea in Revelation of an ark in heaven. I don't think it's talking about the earthly ark. I think it's talking about a heavenly ark. Uh, image that he saw, symbolism. I don't believe the real ark is in heaven. I don't know what happened to it. I don't care. I've got Jesus. I don't need it. 
I can't touch it anyways, I'll die, right? So, so what's it matter, okay? If Indiana Jones can't find it, I can't find it. The point is, well, actually, he did find it. He did find it, and they put it in a government warehouse. But it was crafted by human hands. All the things that we're talking about today were made by individuals. And we're building the case for next week understanding that we have something in our life that was not created by mankind, that was not created by humanity. In fact, the Ten Commandments talk about we will not serve a, a God or, or worship a God that's been crafted right in the image, right? Our God does not operate that, uh, operate that way. Read verse 6. Now, when these things had been uh, thus prepared, the priests always went into the first part of the tabernacle performing the services. I kind of I referenced that. But into the second part, the high priest went alone once a year, not without blood, which he offered for himself, and for the people's sins committing in ignorance. The Holy Spirit indicated this, that the way into the holiest of all, the Holy of Holies, was not yet made manifest while the first tabernacle was still standing. The second thing about this old covenant was, it was off limits to mankind. This is important. The high priest, once a year, went in and made an offering on behalf of the entire nation. Now, why, why is that important to understand? Could you imagine if once a year you only got to talk to your best friend or someone you really cared about? Once a year. Could you imagine if the only time God listened to your prayers was once a year? How, how, where would you be? I, 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 would, I talk to God all the time. I pray for strength all the time, for help, for encouragement, for wisdom, all the things that, that, that we all should be praying about constantly. But imagine if I could only do that once a year. It would be miserable. It would be awful. Well, that's exactly what the case was here. Once a year, they were able to encounter the presence of God. Now, here's the cool part. It's kind of a spoiler for next week. That veil that was there created a, a boundary a barricade. It prohibited individuals from being in God's presence. There was a distinct separation. When Jesus Christ, and a lot of people know this, you probably have read your Bible, when Jesus Christ hung on a cross and breathed his last breath, meaning that he physically died, many things happened. Sky went black, the dead rose, people are walking around, uh, you know, the earth shook, but something happened in the temple. And it says that that veil or that curtain or that boundary tore from the bottom up, that it was, it was ripped in half. And think about it, or I get it backwards, top down, that's right. Why, why would anything tear from, why would I say that? That is, thank, thanks for the correction. Yeah, get that right, top down. Yeah, the idea, and by the way, this wasn't just a real thin cloth right? We're talking a massive fabric, and it was torn in half. Now, imagine if you're the priest in there, right? You're the priest in there, and something that you're not allowed to enter in only once a year, you're now looking at it. Not exactly a very calm situation, but that image right there, that picture right there was the now removal of the boundary of the, the physical barrier between God and mankind. It had been replaced with someone whose arms were wide open, creating a bridge to God. Now, this is the cool part about it. Um, Jesus coming into our life and providing for us the sacrificial salvation that we need now gives us access to God instantaneously anytime we want. And that comes with the new covenant. That comes with the new arrangement. That comes with the new gift that has been provided by Jesus, by Jesus Christ. That I, I can't imagine what life would be like with God only one time a year. Now, they obeyed Him, and they had the Scriptures. I'm not trying to make it sound like they didn't have anything, but the only thing they really relied on was this offering system with the priests involved. It smelled, it, it, it cost money, it was uh, you know, very, very volatile and very difficult. And with Jesus now in the picture, 
He has paved the way for our instantaneous access to God. And I'll tell you something, my friends. You shouldn't want to tra tra uh, trade that for anything. You shouldn't want to trade that for anything. This old temple, this old tabernacle, all these pieces of furniture, they were created by human hands. They were built with human hands. Access to God was restricted heavily. Heavily. There's off limits to man. Read on. Verse 9. <clears throat> it was symbolic for the present time in which both gifts and sacrifices are offered which cannot make him who performed the service perfect in regard to conscience. Concerned only with foods and drinks, various washings and fleshly ordinances imposed until the time of reformation or the, the time of change. And what you come to now is something that's also very important. That Old Testament covenant, that old temple, that old tabernacle, it was an external covenant, not an internal. You say, what's the big deal about this, Pastor? External, internal, I don't get it. In the Old Testament, that sacrificial system did a few things. Uh, it made it very difficult for the people to um, you know, operate. It was very tedious. It was very difficult. It cost them money. Uh, it, it cost them, you know, I mean, imagine if you had to walk into the temple to offer sacrifices in front of everybody else. I wonder what he did this day. I wonder what she did. Okay? So it was always about the outside. But it never, it never forgave sin or washed sin. It covered the sin. It was a covering. When you get into the New Testament covenant with Jesus Christ, you get into something that's much more powerful, much more personal, and much more uh, essential. Jesus was concerned with the inside. We spent time in Sunday school and we were talking about um, the differences between Joseph and his situation and Jesus in the New Testament. Joseph is what we call a type of Christ. There's many things that Joseph went through that show pictures of the things that Jesus went through, right? Betrayed, uh, cast off, you know, sold, sold, right? Judas sold out Jesus. Joseph ultimately was placed in a, in a situation where he could uh, save the people from their from their failings, from their, their sins, or not their sins, excuse me, from their, their, the famine, the, the food issue. And then you get to Jesus, who himself went through all the same kind of things, went through all the suffering, all the abandonment, all the pain, but Jesus paid with his life to provide eternal, internal life change. He didn't just cover the sin, he washed the sin. The Bible makes it explicitly clear that Jesus, although he cares about our physical external situation, he is concerned more with the internal. You probably notice that there's a main focus of the ministries of this church. Um, we support ministries throughout the world that have feeding centers, orphanages, uh, you know, clinics, dental, uh, you know, health clinics. Uh, we, we do medical missions. We do all sorts of stuff to help people physically. But there's a goal under the surface that is the ultimate goal of this church and of this ministry, and that is to treat the spiritual ailment of the people. We prayed over several people recently. We prayed over Jessica last week. We talked about Dave and uh, other individuals today that, that we've prayed over. We're praying for their physical ailments because they're, they're believers in Christ. We don't have to pray for their salvation. But Jesus Christ, when he came to this earth, yes, he had compassion on the multitude. Yes, he saw their ailments and their sufferings, and he felt for them. He cried when Lazarus died, so we know that he had that emotion. But he always was concerned with their spiritual ailment because that's what mattered most. And my friends, I'm going to tell you today, it doesn't matter how wealthy you are, how special you are, how important you think you are on the outside. It doesn't matter. 
What matters is what you've done with Jesus Christ. Because that's the eternal solvent. That's the eternal change. That's the eternal medicine that's necessary for your spiritual ailment. And if you think to yourself that you're just fine, okay, might call it bumper sticker theology, I was born once fine. People, people who are in the world, they, they, they think that, that there's no God and there's no need for salvation. Um, the Bible makes it very clear that we were all born into sin and we were all needing assistance in there. I think of the brothers, the friends of the, the man who was ailed and they took him to Jesus and the line was so long to get into the house that they tore off the roof and they lowered him down. And what did Jesus ask the man? He didn't ask him why he was there. He said, your sins are forgiven. He was concerned with the ailment of the heart. He was concerned with the spiritual situation. And then he healed him physically. I want Jesus to do everything possible for you. I, I, I want you to be able to be blessed. I want you to be able to be uh, you know, happy. I want you to have joy. I want you to have all the things in life that, that are truly important to God. But I'll tell you, I want you to know Jesus as your Savior much more than I want those other things for you. And sometimes in life, you will suffer as a Christian. Sometimes in life, you will suffer. That is this world, and that is the things that come in it. You might be having a great time in your life right now. Things might be happy. Good. I am happy for you, and I pray that it stays that way. But that is not the case for everyone. Externally, things might be fine, but internally, they may not be. And that goes for more people than you know. People that you think might have it together truly don't. That's why this old covenant in the Old Testament, it wasn't something that was meant to be long-term. You understand that? Is the tabernacle still up? No. Is the temple still there? No. What about the altar? No. About the, the, the te- no, none of that's there. Now you have Orthodox Jews that are still practicing, but, but the, the, the things that we're talking about here, they are no more. Because Jesus Christ came along and He changed the game. He fulfilled the Old Testament promises. He fulfilled that sacrificial system. And I've shared it before, but I'll say it again. When you compare the Old Testament sacrificial system and the law versus Jesus Christ, you'd be a fool to pick this. You'd be a fool because it's all external. It's all show. Yes, it was, it was there as an as a important part to teach the people to look to Jesus. But I got news for you. All you need to do is look around in this world, and if that doesn't cause you to look for something else, you're blinded. This world is a nasty place. There are people that want to destroy your life. There are people that want to, um, you know, take advantage of you, use you, and then cast you off to the side. Um, but we, as believers, are looking for internal help and internal joy and internal hope, and that is from Christ alone. My hope is found on nothing less than Jesus' blood and righteousness, as the song says. Right? We we, we can't hope. In our, in our best friend or our family or our jobs or our money and how important we are, how pretty or ugly we are. You can't, you can't look at all that stuff. You have to look to Christ. So I ask you today, are you leaning on the old stuff? Are you still playing Betamax in your house? You still got a CD player? It's amazing. I go to auctions and I see some of the stuff that's still in the house. It's insanity what, what some people keep. Uh, hoarders. It just, it's crazy. But if you're still holding on to stuff that isn't of value anymore, spiritually speaking, you're missing the most important thing that the Lord has done for you. Okay? If you're looking at your own good deeds, you're missing the boat. Well, I've not missed church in 38 years. That's awesome. Great. Where's your heart at? Well, I, 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 you know, I'm not perfect, but at least I'm not this person. I believe Jesus had a problem with that in the New Testament, didn't he? Right? There was a guy in the temple who was there, 
crying out for forgiveness, and the Pharisees were looking around, and they're like, huh, sure glad I'm not like this guy. That's who Jesus was interested in, because Jesus knew that his heart was in the right place. Again, external versus internal. Something that has instant access, unlimited uh, uh, you know, help. I don't know about you, but I get really frustrated when I have a um, you know, a tech question or something like that. I'm pretty good with networking and programming and stuff, and, and I can fix a lot of stuff myself. But there are some times where uh, you have to call tech support because you need a, a MAC address or you need an ID or, you, you know, you need a, a, a password. And it's an American number. It's a 1-800 number. And you speak to John. But his name ain't John, and he don't sound like a John. You think you're calling Texas, but you're really calling Bolivia, Texas. Or, you know, and, and I'm not trying to make light of it. Everybody needs a job. But when, when you call, call someplace, you want to be able to understand them, right? You're like, hey, man, I just need this. Well, well tell, me, tell me your last name. Tell me your social security. Tell me your, your mom's dog's first name. I don't know. Just give me the, give me the info. Do you know this? Even those tech support numbers have limited hours, right? If they shut down, even if you could understand them, you can't call them until the next day, usually after 5 o'clock. Um, you can Google things, but if you don't have power and you don't have Internet, you can't Google, right? Do you know you don't have to do any of that stuff to reach our Lord Jesus Christ? It's instantaneously. That comes with Jesus Christ, the new covenant not the old. The temple had hours. I don't know what it'd be like to not have access to God anytime I wanted, just one time a year. And then, of course, you go back to the first point that the old covenant, the old stuff was made by human hands. The minute you make something, it begins to deteriorate. The second you are born, the clock starts on how long you're on this earth. You understand that, right? I mean, we can, we can try to dance around the, the idea of of death and passing on, but it's real. I talked to someone this week who was really, really upset about a loved one. Not even in his family. It's, it's uh, his son-in-law's uh, grand, uh, mother, I think. Yeah, so it would have been his grandkid's grandmother. And this man, a member of our church, he's not here today, was vi- visibly distraught over this funeral he had to attend. And I was talking to him and and he said, you know, I've dealt with, I've had death in my family my entire life, and I can usually handle it, but for some reason, this time, I'm really struggling, Pastor. And I said, why? He said, well, because my grandkids are struggling with it. And he said, I don't care about my kids anymore, I have grandkids. I said, that typically runs in all families, right? You know, but death comes to us all. But this is the important thing you need to realize. The God that we worship And the Savior that we have accepted was not created by human hands. He's not Buddha. He's not the Virgin Mary. He's not Muhammad. He's not a statue. He's not an ancestor. He's not an animal. Some people worship animals. He's not our money. Some people worship money. None of that. He's the eternal God. Forever and forever and forever, amen. And he is sitting on the throne right now, and you can call his number any time you want. Jeremiah 33, 3, Call unto me, and I will answer and show you great and mighty things which you know not. That's the Old Testament phone number right there for God. You can call it anytime you want. It just requires you to talk to Him and pray to Him. Can you do that? I don't know. That's a question for you. If Jesus is your Savior, you can do that. Some scholars disagree with this. I'll tell you my position. I don't believe the prayers of lost people make it to heaven. I don't believe God hears them. You may disagree with me on that. That's fine. I think the Old Testament speaks very clearly to that, that the prayers of someone who is an unbeliever, God doesn't answer because 
they don't have the number to call him. And the number is Jesus Christ. Just understand this. It's not a matter of prayers can, from lost people can reach heaven. It's a matter of your prayers can reach heaven. Right? Why don't you accept Jesus Christ so it's not even an issue? I don't know where you're at today. I don't know what you're struggling with. We all are struggling with something. But we worship a God that was not created by human hands. We worship a God that is accessed to instantaneously through Jesus Christ. And He is taking care of our internal needs and our external needs. We call it His providence. He provides for us as well, Bill. It's not just He didn't just provide salvation and say, kick you to the curb and say, see you later. No. The, 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 the job you have, the stuff you have, that was a blessing from God. You can either steward it well, give back to God, or He can take it from you. Because He will. All I know is this. All of these things in the Old Testament were designed to be temporary. None of them are around anymore. But Jesus is still on the throne. Jesus is still around. God is still here. God is speaking to you right now. God is in the presence with us. The Bible says we're two or more together. I am in the midst. The Holy Spirit, if you're saved, has sealed you. He's a part of your life. You have all three members of the Trinity going for you right now. That's much greater than what they had in the Old Testament. Who do you have on your team? Things that are temporary, stuff that won't matter on down the road when it needs to be retired, or something that's eternal, something that's forever. Don't trust on man-made rituals. Don't trust on tradition. Don't trust on stuff, how good you are. None of that stuff matters. God's what matters. He's eternal. His shed blood made a way for you to have eternal life. Why would you want anything less than that? Would you bow your heads with me today? You know, I don't know your situation. I know we all struggle. We all have different things going on. Uh, but I, I would just ask that you speak to God right now. You see, if you're a Christian, you have that number right away. You can talk to God. What do you need to talk to him about? Spend a moment talking to him. He's listening. You have that number. He can understand you and you can understand him. You see, the Holy Spirit, it tells us when we don't know what to pray, he prays for us. I pray that you have that relationship with God. If you don't, you see me after service and we can, we can talk about that. The God we serve was not created by human hands. He is eternal and forever. Why would you want to spend eternity away from Him? Father, we conclude this service, and if there's one today that, that needs prayer or needs assistance from someone, I pray they would seek out one of the pastors, myself, or any of the staff, and get the help they need. Lord, I don't know everybody's situation, but I know you do. And I know you're in our midst today. Forgive us of our failures. I'm so thankful that the old was taken out, dealt with. It was temporary. That boundary and all the stuff that went in with that sacrificial system is gone. And we're with you always now. May we never take it lightly. Next week we'll study the new covenant, the new scenario, the new blessings we have in Christ. We've, we've hinted on them today. They're much greater and much more powerful and they're eternal. Lord, bless Bible school this week. May we see souls for our labor. In Christ's name, amen. amen. Brother Larry, would you come? Appreciate the word today, and I'm glad those things are past and we have Jesus Christ to depend on. Amen. Uh, just a few announcements. One thing that's not in your bulletin, uh, parents of teenagers, uh, listen up. Uh, there is a, uh, Pastor Garrett and Anna's going to, start a newsletter for uh, the parents of uh, teenagers for their, their class. And, and if you can sign up your name and email address at, at the Welcome Center, just a weekly, a monthly newsletter, I'm sorry, just uh, 
description of the lessons they're doing and the upcoming events and all that. So parents of teenagers, please sign up for that and you'll get a newsletter. Also, just want to mention that uh, there's going to be a class starting July 14th uh, in the green room and it's going to be uh, on uh, the gifts, so spiritual gifts. That's just going to be for six weeks, so if you're interested in that, uh, that'll start July 14th. Uh, a lot of things happening. Remember, no service tonight because we're setting up for Bible school right after church today and uh, also Bible school this week. But next Sunday morning, no Sunday school, we'll have a pancake breakfast in the Family Life Center, fundraiser for the youth. So that'll be at 915 instead of Sunday school, all right? So, so just remember that. No service tonight. Uh, a lot of events coming up, Bible school especially this week. Uh, there is a newsletter, Access, uh, the youth newsletter is at the... Uh, Welcome Center, too, if you want to pick one of those up. All right, it's been a good day in the Lord's house. Amen? Beautiful weather today. Enjoy it. It's not raining yet, so we can enjoy that. All right? Let's stand. We'll be dismissed. Appreciate each one being here this morning. Father, I thank you for your word. Thank you for the uh, the message that was preached today. Dear God, help us to remember, dear Lord, that uh, uh, that you came to do away with the old things, that we have all things.